Okay, so um, yeah, so, so today I want to talk about um, dependency management and how to be deliberate about it. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to get into uh, why I think that's a, uh, a topic to, to talk about. So, so I see um, a lot of teams and organization that struggle with dependencies. Um, it can be uh, many different kinds of dependencies and struggles. But so one uh, thing that is quite common is that uh, the organization is structured in a way so that uh, to get something out, you have to coordinate a lot of teams. So then you have dependencies between teams uh, and you get a lot of coordination overload meetings instead of uh, collaborating on, on getting uh, good software out. Um, Another very common uh, dependency challenge is in organizations that adapt uh, microservices uh, as a, uh, their, their main architectural style um, and are not doing it uh, quite cleanly. So they end up with uh, what's sometimes called a distributed monolith. So, the, so you have services that are uh, highly coupled and it makes the evolution uh, difficult. You can also uh, get similar problems by having shared libraries uh, or increasing coupling. So this makes these teams that should really be autonomous, um, not really being that auto uh, autonomous anyway. And um, a third thing when it comes to dependencies is just keeping up with the uh, uh, general technical uh, evolution of new versions. Uh, or sometimes uh, like uh, we had before Christmas uh, with a, a high priority security fix that had be, to be rolled out across uh, maybe a, a half or a third of all Java backend uh, deployments across the world with Log4j. Uh, and, and one of the challenges uh, when it comes to keeping up with versions is uh, the trade-off between uh, continuously updating everything or uh, doing it uh, too rarely and, and sitting with old stale versions and, and compatibility problems. So, so these are some of the dependency problems. Um, so to get into it, uh, uh, to this and to be able to be deliberate about uh, how to deal with it, we, we're gonna look at uh, some categorization of dependencies. So, yeah, as mentioned initially, uh, one kind is the organizational dependency, the cross-team dependency. Um, and one way of recognizing that what you have is a cross-team dependency is that it's a dependency that typically causes your plan to fail. Um, the next kind is your uh, uh, software static dependencies. That's uh, your libraries, your operating system, uh, frameworks and, and uh, those things that your software uses. Uh, one way of recognizing those dependencies is that's the ones that cause your build to fail. Um, and then the third kind is your dynamic dependencies. So that's the, the runtime dependencies uh, from your service to other services or to your database or some external third party system that you're talking to. Um, and one of the ways to recognize those is that's the, the, the kind of dependency that causes your system to fail in production. And my fourth and last kind of dependency is something that you're not necessarily recognized as a dependency, and that's um, the people that depend on you uh, and what you deliver. Because once you've published uh, your stuff and they start to use it, you're actually very much dependent on how they use your things because that will uh, control uh, your freedom of changing. So you recognize those dependencies because they get upset when you break their stuff. Okay, so uh, with all these problems, why, why do we introduce dependencies in the first place? So this is um, uh, an example 
microservice uh, apparently uh, doing some something with weather reports but also has uh, some subscription stuff logging and, and config so one of the reasons why we introduce dependencies between teams and uh, uh, services is that uh, the total application scope is too big for a single team so we partition the work and the responsibility between teams uh, and that makes it nice because then someone else will solve that problem um, another reason that we introduce dependencies is because the problem is already solved so for example, for logging, uh, there are several different nice uh, libraries out there that we can just introduce as dependencies and, uh, and, uh, and we don't have to implement the details ourselves. And the third one is that we want to extract a capability to improve the functional cohesion of our software. So basically uh, our team, we want to uh, focus on the weather uh, domain uh, and not spend uh, brain cycles on uh, thinking about the best way to dynamically configure a microservice. And one of the important things to make this uh, in a successful way is to actually hide solution details be behind those abstractions. All right. So, this splitting of things out from our microservice. Uh, it's very much related to concepts from uh, domain-driven design. So it's domains and bounded context. And a lot of microservice architecture thinking is inspired from domain-driven design. Uh, and, and generally, you're going to be much better off uh, if you learn some of it and, and adapt some patterns. So, uh, so for these things to be good dependencies from a DDD perspective, they should be of reasonable size. So, uh, so that a single team uh, can manage uh, that concept and, and that domain in boundary context. Uh, there should be functional cohesion. So, so just to be clear, I'm focusing now on, on the, the content of that weather report service. So uh, when looking at what should be inside there or what should be outside in, in, that might be a, a dependency. So does this logic deal with weather reporting or is it uh, actually something else? And one of the things uh, that uh, is really interesting then uh, when looking at dependencies and uh, management of them is how does our stuff relate to the things we depend on. Uh, what's the nature of that dependency? Okay, so that's uh, probably quite nice and it looks clean, but uh, let's do a reality check it, because this nice clean picture is not typically what it looks like with the teams uh, I encounter. Uh, and so going a little bit to a uh, reality inspired uh, walkthrough. So this is uh, based on a uh, situation and a team to my question. So, uh, so we have this uh, service that the team is responsible for. Um, uh, there are some other services in, in, the, uh, uh, in the environment. The service has uh, an administration UI and there are external clients. So, in this case, let's look at the team dependencies to start with. Right, so in this organization, uh, there, there has been a decision to have a separate team develop the administration, uh, administ uh, admi administration interface for the service. So uh, the um, domain for the service is actually shared between two different teams. Uh, that means that there is a very uh, high coordination need between these two teams. Um, there's also another service team that uh, that, uh, that the service uh, depends on quite much. 
and there's quite a lot of new development going on with this team. So there's a, another big coordination need there. Uh, then there are a few other uh, services and teams that share uh, libraries uh, in this system. And that means that there is a, a, a shared context uh, for how those libraries are built and used. Uh, so that means that there are additional teams to coordinate with. So, uh, and then um, what, what about the um, teams building the, uh, the clients using the, uh, the public API? Well, uh, for this team, it, they're actually a little bit known. So we, they don't really know who they are and what they do. So, so this is, can be a typical real life scenario with, with these team dependencies. Uh, moving on to real life view of the runtime dependencies. This, these are pretty straightforward. The, there's a, a protocol using HTTP uh, going in from the admin UI. Uh, there are synchronous RPC calls to one service. Uh, some other services um, uh, use um, event-based calls uh, in both directions. Uh, and the public clients have uh, also a, a REST-based API. So, so what's the challenge here? I mean, th this is a pretty common scenario. So the question uh, and challenges in, the, in these dependencies is uh, partly operational. So uh, what if these synchronous requests uh, start to become slow, uh, then our service will also be slow in terms of serving uh, customers. Uh, what about uh, service evolution? When, when one of the other services uh, uh, updates the protocol, will it be backwards compatible? How, how can we make sure that it's not going to break uh, in production? And last but not least, in this case, are static service dependencies. So it starts with, uh, I mean, uh, we need to run on some operating system. In this case, it's uh, uh, containerized Linux using uh, Docker or Kubernetes. Um, we run on a platform, that's the Java, in this case, version 16. Um, like most microservices, there's a microservice framework in the bottom. Um, and then we come to the, uh, uh, to the additional dependencies. And this is where uh, we bring in a lot of uh, dependencies. There's a set of libraries within the organization to start with, and they, in their turn, bring in an even bigger set of uh, open source libraries that they depend on. Uh, and it's a fantastic mix of things. And uh, at the very top of it, the actual service has uh, binary static dependencies uh, towards the, uh, the other services. So there's a mix of both um, dynamic and static dependencies there. So what's the challenge uh, in this case? I mean, it's a fairly common picture, but it's, it's uh, a little bit messy. Well, so for um, the feature development, uh, there are uh, a lot of the things that need to be developed uh, cover collaboration between three teams. And typically in this organization, uh, th these three teams have uh, separate backlogs um, uh, with separate prioritization. And there's an overhead of program management and meetings to make sure that things are done uh, in a way so that some kind of value can be delivered uh, within at least a few months. All right, so, so, so what's the cause of this uh, dependency problem? Well, uh, one of them is uh, misaligned team boundaries. Um, the, uh, the boundaries here have been based on functional uh, instead of domain-based uh, reasons. So there's a front-end team and, and the back-end team uh, rather than making that a cross-functional team that can work with the features uh, across uh, that divide. 
and we end up with a lot of coordination instead of collaboration. Um, another challenge um, is um, what, what I've called a commons library gridlock. So basically um, with all the interdependent internal libraries, um, uh, when, um, when the new version happens to need uh, an additional uh, parameter, uh, we may run into the problem that uh, the actual parameters that it needs are sent through some other API in one of the common libraries. So instead of just being able to update that one dependency, uh, uh, the, uh, the setup or, or the situation requires uh, cascading updates to other uh, classes and libraries as well. And that makes it really hard to, uh, to get a good flow and, and specific uh, targeted uh, um, changes. So what's the cause of this problem? Well, uh, in my opinion, the, the, the scope of these uh, common libraries uh, was too, big, uh, too large to begin with. So, um, so there's, there are too many um, unrelated things in the same uh, library. Uh, and how did you end up there? Well, uh, many of the teams, uh, or uh, it's been kind of a common practice that a team develops something and they think, oh, this is somewhat generic. Maybe someone else uh, could have a use for that. So I will add it to the common library because I'm nice, I, I'll help someone else. Um, and in a microservice uh, architecture, that's actually not helping because if everyone kind of adds their new uh, support feature to the common library, uh, that means that uh, it grows, um, but uh, main maintenance wise, uh, we don't really know uh, who uses the new things, who uses the old things, uh, and, um, uh, and the whole governance of that library becomes really hard uh, once you get to the, to the updates situation. And to make matters a little bit worse, uh, the, um, uh, some of the APIs in these common libraries expose um, third-party uh, library types. So uh, when, there, when you want to upgrade this third-party library in the general solution, uh, you might actually be tied to a previous version because it's part of the exposed API in these common libraries. And that's a mess. Okay, so I'm gonna... Uh, suggest that you can't really be agile if your architecture is a mess. Uh, at least it makes it much harder to be agile. So what I propose is uh, for teams in this situation, or I mean, in general, to look at the dependencies of different and identify the key dependencies and, their, and the key dependency challenges. Um, try to analyze and map uh, the relationships and the dependency patterns and then make deliberate choices on how to work with dependencies. So, so my experience is that um, a lot of dependencies get added um, with very little thought about the long-term uh, maintenance uh, situation. So how do we go about this? Well, number, number one, uh, thing is uh, actually finding or listing your dependencies. I mean, it can be the teams you depend on, it can be services, but in terms of the uh, actual code, uh, you can use uh, your code dependency manager, uh, Maven, Gradle, or NPM, depending on what platform you're uh, using. So typically, if you're using Maven, you can run the Maven dependency analyze report, which will list your dependencies uh, and also tell you uh, what dependencies uh, you have declared uh, that you might actually not be using, but also dependencies that you haven't declared that you are using because it's quite easy in, in our modern IDEs to, to just uh, import something from a transitive dependency that just happens to be on your class path. Okay, so once you've... Um, made that list of dependencies. Um, 
well, number one, uh, identify the ones that are actually significant for you. So if, don't you don't have to be deliberate about every little dependency, but the key, uh, key capabilities uh, you should look at because some, some dependents are just uh, convenience utilities that can be easily replaced if you want to. The next thing to look at is uh, what type of relationship you have with the team or whoever is providing uh, that dependency. So uh, are you working as uh, collaborative partners? So for example, the, the feature development for this sample team, uh, working with the uh, team that only a partnership. So neither team can be successful without the other one. Uh, another um, relationship type is customer supplier. So the supplier provides the dependency, but the customer asks for the features in it. Um, and then there are uh, one relationship where you basically can use this dependency off the shelf. So the, uh, the people, building it don't really have any clue as to who's using it so that's typically your third party open source libraries but you can also uh, within a larger organization have uh, teams that uh, that build uh, support platforms uh, providing the same level of service which is great third thing to look at is um, the stability or reliability of this dependency. So um, does that pose challenges when updating? So uh, does it have good um, versioning practices? Uh, do the, uh, the people developing it uh, care about and verify that they're not introducing breaking changes? And also, how often does it change? So for dependencies that don't change very often, uh, you probably don't need to spend a lot of time thinking about how it changes. And so once you've kind of identified those things, um, then it comes down to looking at, okay, so how, uh, um, how should we uh, make, uh, well, how should we handle this dependence in a good way? And I'll, so there's a lot of really good uh, inspiration from domain-driven design there, and that's where we're going now. So, <clears throat> so within domain-driven design, there's a um, slightly hidden chapter in in the great blue book uh, called uh, that talks about context mapping, and it, it identifies a number of different patterns. So this is about the relationship between your uh, dependencies. So. One such pattern is what's called a shared kernel. So that's when two teams, or actually it could be more than two teams, have some piece of code that act, that's actually shared uh, and that applies to both their uh, internal models. That makes it really hard to maintain because then you, you need to collaborate and coordinate all the time. So that's, that's one of the things that you should try to avoid if you can that you might need to, uh, in, in specific instances, you might need it. Um, another pattern, and this is uh, about how you as a user of a dependency uh, can approach it. So that's a, a, a conformist. So basically you say that, okay, this the model that I depend on is um, perfectly fine. Uh, I can use it as it is. Um, one, very um, good pattern is uh, adding an anti-corruption layer. So basically uh, within our service, we have uh, the model, uh, our cohesive model of, uh, of, uh, of modeling our problem. And when we talk to the, the, our dependency, uh, what we do is that we convert that model into our model and it isolates the internals of our system from the changes uh, externally. Uh, there are also uh, additional patterns that I'm not gonna go into uh, due to lack of time, but basically th there's a lot of good uh, ideas from uh, DDD uh, context mapping when looking at the different dependency strategies. So 
uh, so, so an example could be um, our dependency towards uh, the user service. So we, from a significance point of view, we say that this is really a key dependency. We can't run without that dependency. Um, with a team relationship, um, well, in this case, um, we're, we're not really in a partnership with the team building the user service. We're just using it as it is. And uh, the, um, the pattern uh, they are using is that they published uh, an API that any service can use and they're not really, uh, it's, it's not a high maintenance relationship. So, uh, and reliability, uh, it's mostly stable. So it, we don't expect it to break if we update it. It's a, it's a um, fairly safe thing to do. And the strategy we use is uh, adding an anti-corruption layer. So if it changes, uh, we still have our own view of the user concept within our service. So this can be a kind of, this is a, a deliberate, deliberate view of how we use the user service dependency. And uh, so I'll finish up with a few recommended patterns and policies for different kinds of uh, dependency challenges. So, so one of the things is um, upgrading platforms. So uh, many teams are possibly currently thinking, should we upgrade our uh, Java version to 17 or maybe going from eight to 11, depends on, on how far behind you are. Um, so for platforms, evolution is typically quite slow and very reliable and very seldom backwards incompatible changes. Uh, but compatibility is key. So anything that we deploy on the platform needs to be able to run on it. Um, my recommendation is to not lag too far behind. You shouldn't still be on Java 8. You should definitely not be on Java earlier than 8. Um, a good uh, thing to do is regularly test your stuff with the latest version, but not necessarily uh, deploy it on that, but rather uh, depend on a stable version of the platform in production. Um, next one is frameworks. And frameworks are, are a little bit special when it comes to dependencies. So they can be a real productivity booster. So they can, so the value can be really high, uh, but there can also be a big compatibility lock-in. And, and the reason for that with frameworks is typically uh, a framework makes uh, you adapt your code uh, to, to the framework. So uh, it's quite likely that the framework touches much more of your code than uh, other dependencies. Uh, one thing to really, uh, stay away from is building your uh, local organization framework extensions because then you're really tying into this particular version and, and makes it really hard to uh, to upgrade when uh, a new generation of the framework comes. And as with the platform, regular test for the latest version, but depend on a stable one in production. Right, one of my pet peeves is the internal libraries. Well, if you have them, make them really small and specific in scope. Um, it, it, for convenience, you can um, well, build many small libraries, but still maintain them in a single repo so that you don't get the overhead. Uh, make sure that you keep the API of your libraries really clean. Um, keep it to only platform classes and the particular uh, library API. Don't mix in your framework classes in your internal libraries. That's a, uh, that will give you dependency help. Uh, one more thing, try to assign clear ownership of your organization internal libraries. It's not a uh, long-term good idea to say, well, these five teams manage it uh, kind of together. So, Find the small parts, make sure that there is a team responsible for it. And also add an explicit deprecation policy. How can we um, make sure that things that should be moved out of a library can be? So basically say, 
all the uh, teams using a library, um, you need to update within three versions or three months or something, just so that it's possible to take away old code that shouldn't be there anymore. And the last one is for service dependencies. So your runtime dependencies. Um, one good thing is um, if you can do a, a published language to so basically uh, have a protocol specification rather than depending on implementation details and make that a, a kind of clear specification. Uh, I would recommend uh, having dynamic dependencies over static dependencies. So depend on protocols uh, and specifications instead of uh, binary libraries because that uh, decouples uh, development and deployment uh, between the teams. Uh, safeguard your internal logic uh, using an anti-corruption anti layer. And uh, to, um, um, to make um, uh, testing more um, decoupled, uh, you could look at contract testing. So rather than having to spin up a lot of services in an environment and integration test them uh, or integration test your service by depending on everyone else, uh, you could uh, test that uh, the protocols are uh, properly uh, used instead or in addition. And, and you can get um, much uh, more decoupled uh, deployments, which is uh, also a, a common dependency problem. So, um, yeah, so that was um, uh, some of my ideas on how to be more uh, deliberate in your uh, dependency management.